Hi, I'm David Sudek. I'm here at the 26th Annual Meet the Money Conference with Pat Hogan, CEO of CMB Regional Centers. Welcome, Pat. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks again for participating this year. You were on stage earlier on the CEO panel. You did a fantastic job. Well, thank you. Pretty excited to be here. It's an interesting group of people. Yeah, EB5 is hot right now. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the roots of CMB, you know, how things have changed from the 1990s to today and, and what you see as your, your current platform. Sure. Uh, we started in actually 1994, 94. before regional centers were ever involved. So the EB-5 program actually is a permanent program. Most people don't know that because everybody does business with the, uh, uh, as, as a regional center. But I started in 1997 and getting my first regional center. Um, operated f that period. We actually got an approval in the year 2000, but as you know, uh, fraud crept into that particular program and uh, you know, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. It wasn't really a business at that point in time. So I just said, okay, I quit. And until Congress can put some reforms through, uh, I don't want to do it anymore. So you were pushing for regulation? Oh, even back then. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, so you know, fast forward to today, you know, we've been rocked with all kinds of uh, scandals and, and things like that within EB-5. And uh, you would expect that simply because if you go back to 2007, there were 11 regional centers Amazing. and maybe five of us doing something. And then to go to today where you fast forward, you have 800 regional centers. There's bound to be some individuals that uh, don't have a clue. Yeah. Do you have any sense as to how many of those 800 actually do business of any kind? <sighs> you know, I would, I would venture to guess that there are less than 100 okay. regional centers that are really active. I would also venture to guess there's probably 50 projects out there that people have started and just can't get traction on. So it's, uh, that's where our Omaha project came from, where we went into it and they contacted us. It was another regional center. They had two investors after a year and a half of trying to raise money for this hotel project. Um, and we ended up buying the regional center out so that we could actually take over their geographic scope. And I think we raised the money in less than, I think, two months yeah. once we got our... Our, all our approvals and all that. You guys are clear, clearly the leaders in the industry. I mean, it's been very impressive. I know on Century Plaza you raised for $450 million. Yes, yeah, we did that in less than seven months. And truthfully, um, it was a Herculean feat. I don't think I could do that today. Um, it took everything we had to do that. Not only did we raise the money, and we're talking cash in, we also had every single application on file, which I think it was, was a greater feat we were all trying to beat that deadline of the uh, program That's you know, right. uh, expiring. Which we're facing again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, if you know, regulation and straight lines and bright lines were there for all of us, there's just a lack of um, instruction, whether the USCIS or whether it's coming from the SEC. They don't hold seminars and sessions to say, this is what you should do. So you really have to be a student of the um, enforcement actions or the denials or the, or the noids or the, uh, you know, the RFEs that are issued to try to understand what you're supposed to do. Um, and that's why we're very active in attending many of these types of events because we were gleaning information from how we're supposed to do it in the right way. Right. I can tell you from my experience working with CMB on the opposite side that it's been really a pleasure and your team is incredibly conversant with the most recent rulings of uh, you know, USCIS and re I really feel like your structuring is what makes the difference in terms of, su of the success of your project. Uh, yeah, the, it, what was interesting about our structuring is that it's never changed. Um, our partnership agreement in our very first project is really structured similarly the same today. Um, it's amazing it stood the test of time with so many changes in EB-5. Um, for instance, now where the USCIS said that the money still has, I mean, if they pay us back, but we can't pay the investors back because they haven't gotten their I-829s, what do you do with the money? Well, the USCIS has now made a statement that you must redeploy the funds. Well, we've been doing that already. It was built into our, 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 our uh, right. partnership Ancillary agreement. Ancillary investments. So, you know, so it, the, the point was is that it was, we knew that we had to keep the money at risk. We knew that we had to keep, you know, the money flowing. And also, that's... You know, we didn't want the investor to also, um, you know, not have his income that he does have. Uh, you know, the motto of CMB is simply take care of the customer and we're going to make money. Yeah. How have your projects changed over the last 20 something years? I have CMB stands for California Military Base. Sure. That We started out our first, uh, let me see, two plus, because we different, we had 6A, 6B, 6C. Uh, never do that again. The USCIS said, hey, if you can do a big project, break it up. 
So we broke it up in six A, B, and C, and it was a disaster yeah. because they didn't understand. They thought we'd be double counting jobs in each one of them. And, right. and uh, I wanted to send them a picture of an apple and then cut it in three parts. <laughs> okay, and show them they're three distinct parts and none, they don't touch each other, but when you put it together, it's a large project. But yes. I followed your advice and now you don't understand it. So that was quite a, a, a learning experience as we, we went along. But um, that's the thing, the new regional centers don't have that that background of what you have to do to get something through. Right. Um, and I, I think the record I'm most proud of about CMB is we have over 550 IE29s, and as you know, that's the final approval for the investor. And we have never, ever, ever got an RFE. Amazing. How that's, many jobs do you think you've created over this period of time? Well, technically, we, what we report to the USCIS and what we really think we raise are two different things. Um, we were the first ones to come out and only use indirect and induced jobs only and throughout the direct jobs. Simply because we were afraid the USCIS would tell us, oh, you've got to have I-9s, W-2s right. you know, and citizenship papers on every worker, which they did. Um, so we were, again, a pioneer there um, and everybody thought we were crazy. Well, you're not going to get an I-526. Well, we got one. No, oh, you're not going to get an E-29. Well, we got one. And then AILA was recently, you know, not recently, but over the last few years has been saying only use indirect and induced. <laughs> so yes. we, it, the, the whole idea is uh, we don't use, count the direct, but if we went back and did, I'll give you two ex four examples. We've done four Amazon fulfillment centers. Okay. 1.1 million square foot buildings and didn't claim a single employee in any one of those. Wow. Each one of those buildings employ 2,500 workers. There is 10,000 workers that we have never claimed that we helped create and they're all new jobs. Amazon didn't have a single employee in the state of California when we set up. So those are certainly unqualified new jobs, but we just didn't claim them because we didn't want to get into the argument with the SC, USCIS about um, citizenship papers and W-2s and the rest of it. Right. So, so you think you've created far more jobs than you've reported? Sure. We are right now at, to the USCIS, I think we're pretty close to 150,000, but I would suggest that the statistics are really well past 200,000. That's testament to your company and your long track record. It's incredible. It, it, it's truly a testament to the program. Yes. It's, um, if That's the what it was designed to yeah, do. Yeah, that's exactly right. If, it, if, if the program is run properly and the people that are in it are honorable and, and try to take care of the client, um, we'll have that kind of result. It's when you, they try to cheat the program. Um, I'll give you an interesting factoid, is that there were three um, regional centers in 1997, the very first three. One was um, Golden Rainbow Freedom Fund, which is now called American Life. It's very well known. And then the other one's Vermont. Yes. And then the other one is CMB. Um, and CMB kept its name from the Well, nobody had it. I didn't have to change my name. That's Let me right. just say that. Yes. Um, but I will say this. That's 18 years ago or so. It's amazing. Not a, out of those three, only one of them paid anybody back, and that's CMB. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole impressive. project. You know, I, I understand that American Life has paid individuals back, sure. but they have never paid off a whole project. Yeah. And um, I think it's really the difference between an equity model and a loan model. And we were, again, the um, you know, pioneers in that. We were the ones that established the loan model in the uh, 1990s. Right. So you're giving your investors priority repayment over common equity. Absolutely. Which is Which the is safest place to be. Seriously, and that's what you have to look at is right. if there's enough equity in the project itself and you're dealing with quality developers and the rest of it, um, as long as you monitor the projects, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Um, as long as you get also guaranteed minimum pricing on the project that you maybe have sub guard insurance with not too many people know about, right. but it really ends up being a um, really a project guarantee to some extent that it will be completed. Um, you can, and some of our projects do have completion guarantees. So I know one thing, I won't say it to the investors, and I probably could, but with a completion guarantee, you know one thing, the jobs are gonna be created, therefore the visas are gonna be there. Right. So in most of my projects, I would say that I don't, I don't lose any sleep about us getting a visa for them because of having those types of things. Even if the developer fails, we're going to have a project guarantee. Right. And if the project's gonna get done and the jobs are gonna be created and they're gonna get their visas. Yeah. We'll worry about the money that's secondary. You mentioned uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center. So what, what percentage of your project at this point are hotel versus non-hotel? As a percentage, um, it, it's quite interesting because the Century Plaza being 450 million sure. really jumped that percentage. Sure. Um, and I was trying to figure that out as I was looking on the paper today. But I think in, in hospitality, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 million 
um, would have been invested out of uh, 2.4 billion. Unbelievable. Yeah, you know, so. really is an unbelievable statistic. Tell me about uh, your platform, uh, how it's changed. I know 450 million was a Herculean raise. Now we're, I'm working on several projects with you. We're in the 40s, 50s, 60s million. Is that a, a, a change in your platform? To it, it's a change simply because we're not sure what the law is going to be. Okay. Um, I don't, again, take care of the client. If I tried to enter into a project that says I'm going to raise 200 million or 300 million and I don't make it before the, the new you know, uh, uh, change, regime or, or change, whatever happens, um, then I've failed both the developer and the, and the uh, client. So we've decided that this year we're going to do smaller projects so that as we approach that deadline that we know that we can fill the project before the deadline comes. Um, and, that, and that's, we just, it's all about, it's not about the money anymore, it's really about doing it right. And um, we've also retooled ourselves um, and wanted to make sure that we comply with um, SEC. For instance, um, again, another first. No one other regional center has done this. It's taken us almost nine months now. But with 50 projects and 63 loans, we just had BKD, not just, it's been going on for almost eight months. They did an audit from, from day one all the way up through 2014. And every single audit came back, you know, unqualified. At first I thought, unqualified, what does that mean? That sounds bad, but it's actually good, okay? That means that all the money's there and sure. everything's where it's supposed to be. So, you know, we're trying to set a new standard and saying people, hey, look, you know, you, you should show everybody, and not only that, we, uh, you show everybody you're doing the right thing, but we also audited our EB-5 statistics. Right. Because a lot of people stretch the truth about what they've attained and how many jobs they've done, whether how many EB-5 investments they've done. We had BKD audit our EB-5 statistics too. So that when, you know, because I always say to people that are uh, investors, make us prove what we say. And for years I always thought, how can I make you know, myself prove that I'd have to show them all of my right. approvals and the rest of it. So this seemed to be a way out to, to what I've been preaching for all these years. Just don't listen to what somebody says, make them prove what You're they say. You're holding yourself accountable. Yeah, and I think it, it also says to the world that look, you know, no one's gonna have any pity for CMB if they ever got in trouble. I mean, because we're too big a company now. We should know better. And so we've got to take a higher road and again, be that person that leads the way. So let's see how many regional centers now follow us when we can be overseas and telling the individuals, all of our 50 projects have been audited and we will do another audit in 2015 as soon as I get a little rest from doing this one from the beginning from yes. 2014. <laughs> but we will do the 2015 audit and we'll continue to turn out audits each and every year on every single project from now on. So that the whole world knows that every dollar is there because we, as we've seen in recent events, the dollars aren't there in some of these other projects. And it's, um, it's, if we set that standard now, it will be a standard that will have to be upheld or you won't be able to sell. Right, you're leading by example, which yeah. I, I respect tremendously. By yes, that. and I think it, that's, but I think, you know, again, I always think of the EB-5 program as my program because I, I went through the wars. I, was, <laughs> I went through all of the wars of the early 90s and the rest of it. And, um, you know, to, to have the record that we have today, um, and we listen, we're constantly listening. The, you know, I don't necessarily agree with um, the SEC and their regulation because who's your daddy? Right. I mean, we're supposed to be listening to the USCIS and telling us what to do, but the SEC is also giving us guideline and it's becoming a very confusing marketplace because in some cases there's an overlap of if we follow the SEC rules, well, we're not going to be in compliance with EB-5. If we follow the EB-5, we may not be in compliance with SEC. And I have put forward some uh, thoughts that I'd love to see, you know, we have Reg S, we have Reg D. Wouldn't it be cool to have Reg EB-5? Yeah. Where the SEC says, okay, this is how EB-5 exists in a regulatory environment right. today. It you would have, give us some clarity. God, it would give us some yeah. guidance and the rest of it because it becomes very confusing in how we operate. Great point. Yeah. How, what's competition like in China? I know you're in over 80 countries. Is that right? 82 different countries 82 so far. 82 countries. Now. But how's competition in China? I've heard there are a lot of projects. Oh, the there's a lot of projects. And, you know, we, you know, uh, how do I say this? That it, last year we had 200 people on a waiting list that wanted to join a CMB project. We didn't have one. Yeah. But they knew that, you know, CMB. So the word is out who CMB is. 
um, and what we do and how we operate. And the reason we didn't have a project is I couldn't find one that met the characteristics that we want. Not, and, and we're very tough. You know, our, our due diligence team is extremely tough. Um, is, so getting a project that actually fits what we want to do and, um, and be able to take care of the client is not an easy task. And we're staying more with the very large traditional developers uh, so that we can certainly turn out a loan agreement because as you know the Century Plaza loan agreement I think it was 416 pages. Yes, thank you for that. You know, uh, thank you. You know, <laughs> I mean it was like it, it was that was an interesting meeting if you yes. recall of getting the lawyers together from both teams and it, yes. you know I felt like can we all get along you know on this one to try to make it happen but we did. We, we made it, it happen done. and Absolutely. we got it done and and I think it's a good deal for both parties and um, I mean, the, the, if you don't take care of the investors, you don't give them some type of recourse, um, you know, then you're not doing your job. Although the law says the money has to be fully at risk, it, it doesn't have to be foolish. Right. Every project that I've worked on with you has had a very high quality sponsor, but in the marketplace in general, I've heard that the quality of sponsorship is going up, the quality of projects is improving. Is that your experience? I think we're driving that. I think, okay. it's in, and uh, you know, other companies are driving that that have the success that we have. But you know, for so long, you know, the that Northeast uh, uh, Regional Center was thought of, whoa, they're the poster right. child of VB5, and now we find out it was not so from the very beginning. Um, but, but there's signs when you see that stuff. There, you know, what's the exit strategy? When no one can tell you how to get out, that's a problem. Right. And um, there were signs in that particular that project. And the fact that the government officials um, went over there doesn't mean anything. I mean, you have a name like the Vermont Regional Center, or you have a name like the South Dakota Regional Center, or you have a, you know, the New Orleans Regional Center. It sounds very official and very officious, but those were most of these um, problems have occurred with these umbrella regional centers, right. where there really isn't that, that checks and balances. When you're a regional center, you have to apply and you're answerable to the USCIS. That's one of my, my, my complaints. And I gave testimony in 2011, um, and it's kind of interesting to read it today. Actually, I sent it to uh, both chairman and the ranking members of both, uh, both houses, the Senate and the judiciary, on the, on, uh, and uh, so why didn't you listen? Because it was really, I laid out what was happening today yeah. um, back in 2011 because I could see it and I'd been through the wars. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem with if I see somebody doing something wrong is to mention it because if we don't, we're going to lose this program. Yeah. Thanks for setting a good example. And, and thank you for participating in this uh, well, Meet this the is, Money Conference. This Meet the Money Conference. Meant a lot to us. Well, I, you know, again, I'm hoping that I'd like to keep what I do to a small core of developers right. and a small core of, of lawyers that I work with thank you. because it's, it's so much easier than they understand it and uh, to, as you know turning a regular loan into an EB-5 loan is not an easy task so it's a and I thank you for and your law firm for all the support that you gave us through Absolutely. the largest project we ever did yeah so thank you again okay